Hey there, today we're going to dive into a fascinating book called Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Robert B. Cialdini. Now, this book has been incredibly popular, translated into 26 languages and selling over 2 million copies worldwide. It was even named one of the 75 smartest books of all time by Fortune magazine. But why all the hype? Well, it turns out that this book reveals the science behind the everyday tricks that influence us. Yep, that's right. All those persuasion techniques that sway our decisions have a psychological basis. Cialdini himself, despite being an esteemed psychology professor, found that he was surprisingly susceptible to these techniques in his own life. He'd end up subscribing to magazines he didn't want or buying tickets to events he had no interest in attending. Perplexed, he set out to understand the factors that lead a person to say yes to another person. To unravel this mystery, Cialdini took on roles like salesman, fundraiser and advertiser to observe firsthand the tactics that induce compliance. Over years of field research, he found that while strategies varied widely across industries, most could be categorized into six basic types, each corresponding to a fundamental psychological principle that guides human behavior. And thus, influence was born. The book explores six key principles, reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. Through compelling case studies and incisive psychological analysis, it shows us how our actions are manipulated, often without our awareness. Now, by the end of this book, you'll learn to recognize common persuasion techniques in your daily life. It may not make you smarter per se, but it will certainly make you more discerning and less easily duped. Hello. Every day here we dive into a book that's either a bestseller or something you probably ain't heard about before, but is mad interesting. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure to hit that button and join the squad. But before we dive into the six principles, we need to understand a key concept that enables them to work their magic. Fixed action patterns. Remember this term because it's crucial. It's the important precondition that allows the six principles to exert their influence. So, what exactly is a fixed action pattern? Let's observe turkeys for a moment. Yes, the staple of many a Christmas feast. Mother turkeys are fiercely protective of their chicks. But animal behaviorists have discovered that nearly all of a mother turkey's nurturing behaviors are triggered by a single thing, the cheep cheep sound of turkey chicks. If a chick doesn't cheep, the mother pays it no mind, sometimes to the point of letting it perish. Conversely, when researchers equipped stuffed toys with built-in recorders playing the cheep cheep sound, Mother turkeys immediately shifted into nurturing mode, gathering the toys under their wings. This phenomenon isn't unique to turkeys. For instance, male peacocks fan their tails in courtship displays and will do the same for tourists wearing colorful clothing. Scientists have identified a multitude of rigidly patterned behaviors across many species. These are known as fixed action patterns. They're almost like pre-recorded tapes embedded in an animal's body. Press the right button and the corresponding behavior is activated. Much like turkeys, humans also have fixed action patterns. The difference is that most of ours aren't innate, but learned. In other words, as we grow up, certain psychological buttons take root within us. Like tapes, they play when pressed and whoever can trigger these buttons gains a strong influence over your behavior and can exploit that for their gain. Cialdini provides a prime example in the book, The Contrast Principle in Cognitive Processes. In short, when two things with distinctly different qualities are presented in succession, we tend to see the difference between them as more significant than it actually is. For instance, 
If we lift a light object first, and then a heavy one, we'll perceive the second object as heavier than it really is. This little weapon of influence brought about by the contrast principle is widely used in our daily lives. There's a well-known joke about buying a car. A person, fed up with riding an electric bike in the scorching summer and frigid winter, decides to spend 150,000 wen on a car. They go to order a Volkswagen Golf, but the salesperson says there's no discount and the space feels a bit cramped, so they decide to buy a Tiguan instead, figuring it's not much more money. But then they hear that a Magotan is around the same price and even roomier, so they switch to that. After calculating the final price, it seems they could actually afford a Cadillac. But on the way, they pass a BMW dealership and see the new 3 Series. In the end, they change their mind again. By now, their car budget has quietly crept up to around 350,000 yuan. When we visit a car dealership, the salesperson typically shows us a regular car first, then a pricier one. At this point, the regular car seems even more lackluster, while the pricier one looks great in every way. We can't help but raise our car budget, and that's the contrast principle at work. Why is that? Once this contrast forms in our minds, it becomes a choice between buying this or that. Not a choice of buying or not buying. Now we understand that due to the existence of fixed action patterns, most people's psyches have a press-play feature. In many situations in daily life, as long as certain people or things trigger these principles, we'll react in specific ways without thinking, unwittingly complying with others. The contrast principle is a classic case in point. After hearing all this, you might think that as an extremely rational person, it would be a breeze to see through these little tricks. Reality isn't so simple. Under the influence of fixed action patterns, all sorts of schemes emerge in an endless stream. Are you ready to face them? Let's look at the first scheme, the reciprocity principle. It states that if someone does us a favor, we should do our best to repay them. For example, if your friend gives you a book for your birthday, you'll definitely give them a small gift in return on their birthday. The reciprocity principle is even rooted in our traditional culture. Like the sayings, courtesy demands reciprocity and giving is more blessed than receiving. People who accept kindness but don't repay it are not welcomed by society. However, this principle is inevitably exploited by those who want to use this influence for profit. Think about it. When you're faced with an enthusiastic salesperson in a physical store, after they've served you by letting you try on many clothes, you feel a bit obliged to buy something. That's businesses employing the reciprocity principle. Moreover, sometimes the reciprocity principle doesn't manifest as if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. But in another way, reciprocal concessions if others make concessions to us, we're also very likely to make concessions. This is also known as the rejection then retreat strategy. Simply put, it can be understood as a big request first, small request later strategy. First, they make a relatively large request that's very likely to be rejected by the other party. When the other party rejects this request, they then make a smaller one, which is much more likely to succeed. In our daily life, bargaining is a perfect manifestation of the rejection-then-retreat strategy. Typically, the seller will quote a high price, like 100 wen. When the customer expresses that it's too expensive, the seller will usually say, Are you sincere about buying? If you're sincere, I'll give you a better price. So the customer offers 60 yuan, and the seller then says, Oh, you're too good at bargaining. At this price, I won't make any profit. 80 is the lowest I can go. After some back and forth, they settle on 70. The seller sold their goods, 
the customer feels they got a bargain and everyone's happy. If we extend the rejection then retreat principle a bit further, it becomes the compromise effect in behavioral economics. Behavioral economists have done experiments like this. Suppose you're going to buy orange juice and you have two options with the same amount of juice. Orange juice A for 12 yuan and orange juice B for 25 yuan. In this situation, the number of people choosing A and B is roughly the same. But if a third option is added, orange juice A for 12 yuan, orange juice B for 25 yuan, and orange juice C for 58 yuan, then the number of people choosing B increases dramatically. About 70% choose B, 20% choose A, and 10% choose a C. This leads to an increase in the merchant's sales, and this phenomenon is the compromise effect. When we make choices in situations where our preferences are uncertain, we tend to prefer the middle option, because it seems safer and less likely to result in a serious decision-making mistake. Is the influence of the reciprocity principle too powerful? Are we helpless against it? Not necessarily. We need to learn to refuse. There are two modes of refusal. The first is to reject the other party's kindness or concession from the start, which can successfully help you avoid such situations. But sometimes it's hard to judge whether an act of kindness is purely goodwill or has ulterior motives. If you reject a genuinely kind gesture, you might hurt the other person. The second approach has a higher chance of success. If we truly agree with someone's proposal, we might as well accept it. If the proposal has ulterior motives, we can just ignore it. Now we know that while gratitude is a traditional virtue in many countries, when businesses first show you a small favor by leveraging the reciprocity principle, be very wary. This isn't to negate the virtue of being considerate of others. To understand how this factor of influence works, we need to think about the other party's motives and the context of the situation. Now that we understand the reciprocity principle, let's look at the next one, the commitment and consistency principle. Let's start with a test. Suppose you really want to lose weight and complete the task of losing 15 pounds in one month. What should you do? Many readers have probably blurted out the six-character mantra, control your mouth and move your legs, but that's far from enough. Cialdini tells us that the best approach is to write it down and make a plan for yourself. Tell yourself that you must lose 15 pounds this month. Not only that, but also let as many people as possible know about this plan, such as relatives, friends, classmates, lovers and neighbours, the reason for doing this is that everyone has a desire to be consistent in word and deed and no one wants to undermine their reputation for consistency. This is also the psychological basis of the commitment and consistency principle. Similarly, in behavioral economics, there's a similar principle that can explain such phenomena, the endowment effect. The endowment effect refers to the fact that once an individual owns an item, their valuation of that item increases significantly compared to before they owned it. Everyone wants to add weight to their choices. Once we buy a house, we believe that the property we hold is of very high quality and value. This can also be explained by the theory of loss aversion in behavioral finance, which states that the pain brought by equivalent losses is greater than the happiness brought by equivalent gains. Out of fear of loss, people often overestimate the value of a commodity after owning it. So how does this principle affect us? As long as someone, through some means, gets us to make a commitment or take a stand and express an opinion, it can prompt us to unthinkingly and automatically act according to our previous commitment. After making a commitment, people adjust their self-image according to how others perceive them. 
Because we believe what we write down and will adjust our self-image to be consistent with what we've written, our subsequent behavior will be influenced. Others often take advantage of this to achieve their goals. Many companies require salespeople to set a sales target and not just talk about it, but write it down and make a military order. This is using the commitment and consistency principle to put psychological pressure on the salespeople. It's also the reason why, at the beginning, we mentioned making a weight loss plan and letting more people know about it. Because written commitments are more powerful than verbal ones, and public commitments are even more thorough than written ones. Moreover, the more effort you put into a commitment, the greater its influence on you and the less likely you are to give it up. For example, a friend of mine once wrote in her own public account that she would update every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. After updating three original articles a week and persisting for more than two years, she found that she couldn't stop because she couldn't give up the image of updating on time, never missing an update that she had established. No matter how busy she was with work, she would find a way to fulfill this almost permanent commitment. This also tells us that people who go to great lengths to obtain something often cherish it more than those who get it easily. Commitment is so important to us, and it's precisely because of this that some people take advantage of it to lure us into making such choices. Some people will set our image in a position that we want and that benefits us, so we'll comply with requests consistent with that image and it will make us feel like we chose it ourselves. This is what we commonly call flattery. For example, before villains do bad things, they always say lines like this to their accomplices. Bro, how has the boss treated you over the years? The boss has treated me with the highest regard. Good, then the boss has a task for you. For example, when someone is borrowing money, they often say, you're usually a generous person. How come you're being so stingy about lending a little money? Another tactic is to lowball. In the book, Cialdini gives an example where car dealers offer very favorable prices to certain customers, such as $400 lower than competitors. But once the customer makes the decision to buy the car, the dealer will hold a series of activities to cultivate the customer's personal sense of commitment, such as filling out a bunch of car purchase forms, offering loan discounts, or encouraging the customer to test drive the car for a whole day. The dealer knows that during this period, the customer will come up with a lot of reasons to support their choice, proving that buying this car is a great deal. But when it comes to actually buying the car, the dealer will add the discounted $400 back to the price for various reasons, such as the salesperson made a mistake, or they forgot to include the price of the air conditioning, at these was attacked three times by a villain on her way home from work late at night, ultimately dying, while 38 neighbors just watched from their apartment windows, unwilling to even lift a finger to call the police. Psychologists analyze that when there are a large number of other bystanders present, the likelihood of a bystander extending a helping hand in an emergency is lowest. There are two reasons for this. First, when there are others around who can help, the responsibility borne by each individual is reduced and the corresponding guilt is also greatly diminished. Second, in many cases, when faced with an emergency, everyone is at a loss for what to do. They are not heartless, but unable to determine how to react. They want to decide how to respond based on the reactions of others. This is the third principle of influence we're going to discuss. Social proof. The social proof principle suggests that when we are uncertain, the situation is unclear or ambiguous, or there is too much unexpectedness, we are most likely to believe that others' behaviors are correct. When I was visiting New York City, there were many hot dog carts scattered throughout Manhattan, 
but there was always an exceptionally long line at one particular cart near Central Park. Its competitors grumbled, that guy must be paying people to line up at his cart every day, although every cart offered similar hot dogs and they all tasted roughly the same. Most tourists, being unfamiliar with the various carts, would choose to buy hot dogs from the one with the longest line. Clearly, this tactic was highly effective. Think about the long lines at trendy bubble tea shops and popular brunch spots. Doesn't it seem to have a similar effect? When you join those lengthy queues and wait and wait and finally manage to get your hands on the coveted item, you take a bite and think, huh? Is this what all the fuss is about? Because we subconsciously adhere to a rule. If a place has a crowd, their offerings must be great. And this is the first condition in which social proof comes into play. Uncertainty. In an uncertain and unfamiliar environment, people are more inclined to follow the crowd. In addition to uncertainty, the social proof principle has another important applicable condition, similarity. In other words, the social proof principle can exert its greatest influence when we observe the behavior of people similar to us. Here's a startling phenomenon caused by the social proof principle under the condition of similarity. As soon as a suicide story makes the front page of the newspaper, the suicide rate soars in areas with high news exposure. Sociologist Phillips analyzed suicide data in the US from 1947 to 1968 and found that whenever a suicide incident made the front page, the average number of suicides in the following two months was 58 more than usual. This is because reporting suicide news prompts some people similar to the suicide victim to take their own lives, their suicidal thoughts are reinforced by others' suicidal behavior. This pathological example of the social proof principle is also called the Werther effect. Two centuries ago, after the publication of Goethe's novel The Sorrows of Young Werther, it caused a sensation. At the end of the story, the protagonist Werther chooses to end his life by suicide, triggering a wave of suicides in Europe. Because the impact was so strong, several countries banned the book. Putting aside these life and death matters, do any of you readers have places or streets in your hometown where entire areas engage in the same trade? A street for buying clothes, a street for food. Merchants use this model of grouping together to form a kind of social proof then, when you want to buy these things, you unconsciously head there. From the above cases, we can see that in many cases, our response to social proof is completely unconscious and reflexive. As a result, even biased or fabricated evidence can fool us. So how can we resist this trick? Cialdini believes that identifying erroneous data is the best way for us to counter the downsides of the social proof principle. In other words, we need to do our homework regularly. Whether traveling or shopping, it's still very necessary to make a plan. At the same time, when facing some obviously wrong data, we must be alert. For example, we often see street interview videos that seemingly randomly select ordinary people to interview them about their experience using a certain product. It appears that many people use the product and they all have very positive feedback. This makes viewers mistakenly believe that many people use this product and everyone's experience is great. Businesses leverage the social proof principle to achieve sales growth. Each of us is not omniscient, so in unfamiliar environments, we often decide our own behavior based on others' reactions. This is a way to protect ourselves, but it can sometimes lead to tragedies and sometimes be exploited by others. So when we find ourselves in an environment full of uncertainty and notice that everyone's behavior is surprisingly consistent, perhaps we should reflect, is following the crowd necessarily right? Now, Let's look at the fourth principle, liking. 
The liking principle, as the name suggests, means that most of us are more likely to agree to requests from people we know and like. Many people take advantage of this trait of ours to get us to pay for various goods and matters. So how do others use the liking principle to influence us? Cialdini proposes five major factors in the book. The first is physical attractiveness, or in layman's terms, good looks equal justice. This is a very cruel fact. Good-looking people do indeed receive more preferential treatment. For example, attractive job applicants are more likely to pass interviews, while unattractive ones are more likely to be rejected. In the 1960 U.S. presidential election television debate, seasoned Nixon and novice Kennedy faced off. If you listened to this debate on the radio, you'd think the two were evenly matched. But television viewers saw a different picture. A haggard Nixon versus an energetic Kennedy. This gave Kennedy a decisive advantage. Later research showed that attractive candidates were more than twice as likely to get votes as average-looking candidates. So it's really necessary to spruce yourself up regularly. The second point is similarity. We naturally like people similar to us, because similarity means familiarity, and familiarity means a sense of security, whether it's clothing, views, background interests, lifestyle, or accent. Any aspect of similarity can elicit a positive response from us. The third point is compliments. Just like when you try on clothes in a store, no matter how ugly you think you look, the salesperson will always say you look good and have style. And many children's tutoring centres will say your child is especially clever and likeable. No one can refuse praise, even though sometimes we know others are flattering us. But there's no way around it. People who are good at saying nice things are always more endearing to us. The fourth point is contact and cooperation. Most of the time we like familiar things. Familiarity affects people's preferences and plays a role in all kinds of our decisions. Contact and cooperation can make strangers become familiar with each other. Here's a commonplace example. When you're buying a refrigerator, you want the Salis person to give you the lowest price. They'll often say they can't make the decision and need to apply to the store manager. Then they'll go make a phone call. This way they construct a scenario of cooperating with you to fight for your interests. Even if they come back from the call and say they couldn't get a better deal nine times out of ten, you'll still buy that refrigerator. The fifth point is conditioning and association. It sounds a bit abstract, but actually almost every one of us has used it. The phrase people like to say most at the dinner table is, I have a friend who is so amazing at this and that. It's as if having an outstanding friend makes you outstanding too. And in fact it's true. Having a very outstanding friend will indeed change others' perceptions of you. Whether good or bad, as long as something is associated with us, even if it's not something we did, it will affect people's views of us. Businesses often use positive associations to get us to comply. For example, having a beautiful female model stand next to a car, or getting a celebrity endorsement, or associating a product with success. We like beautiful models, celebrities and success, so we'll like products associated with them. Now that we understand the five factors of the liking principle, how can we refuse to let others smoothly influence us by using the liking principle? The method is simple. We only need to pay attention to one thing related to liking. If you feel that you like the other person extraordinarily, quickly and enthusiastically, once you detect this feeling, you should be alert to whether you've fallen into the trap of the liking principle. Understanding this series of principles allows us to always maintain a bit of clarity. 
It reduces the bad choices we make in daily life due to not thinking. Now let's look at the fifth principle, authority. Authority doesn't just refer to academic bigwigs and expert scholars. Sometimes the people around you can also be authorities. There's one thing that left a very deep impression on me. When I was in seventh grade, my deskmate was a top student who often got perfect scores in math. So whenever there was a test, I, the poor student, couldn't help but peek at his test paper. I remember that the last big question on one test was very difficult, but somehow I suddenly had an epiphany and managed to solve it. After solving it, I was a bit unsure, so I peeked at my deskmate's paper and saw that his answer was different from mine. What to do? Forget it. I'll just copy his answer. After all, he rarely scores below 99. As a result, I was called to the office by the math teacher and scolded harshly. We made the exact same mistakes. Many readers probably have experiences similar to mine. And this is the authority principle at work. For me at the time, the top student was the authority in the field of math. It was a blessing to be able to copy his answers. I never considered the possibility of him being wrong. Even if he was wrong, it was still better than me being right. This is the authority principle taking effect. Blindly believing in authority and following authority is an automatic response pattern instilled in us from a young age. In many situations, as long as a legitimate authority has spoken, other things that should be carefully considered become less important. This is also why many famous sayings become famous, perhaps not because they contain profound truths, but simply because they were said by famous people. Similarly, sometimes authority doesn't need to do anything. The appearance of certain symbols is enough to make us comply. What symbols are included? First is titles. Titles have more influence on others' behavior than the person's essence. This is why many people even falsely claim to be doctors, professors, PhDs, CEOs, etc., to gain others' compliance. Second, clothing can also trigger our mechanical compliance response, just as scammers always like to wear well-tailored high-end suits. Another type of symbol that can signify identity, such as jewelry and cars, can also trigger our compliant behavior. This series of external things all add to the sense of authority, and people facing them feel more flustered and self-conscious, easily losing their own opinions and judgment. So how can we avoid being misled by authority status? When similar people or events occur, you can ask yourself two questions. The first question is, is this authority a real authority? What does this mean? There are two dimensions to examine here. The first is the authenticity of the person's authority. If they are indeed an authority, see if the matter at hand matches their field of expertise. The camel's lips must match the horse's mouth. The second question is, are you and the authority on the same side of interests? The value of statements by authority figures like doctors differs in news versus advertisements. We need to consider the nature of the authoritative information. Authority is everywhere. Some are real authorities, some are fake authorities. But in any case, facing authority with neither servility nor arrogance and thinking rationally without blindly following is the solution. Now let's look at the final principle of influence, scarcity. What does this mean? Let's turn our attention to the increasingly intense trend of sneaker flipping. It's become a hot topic. Limited edition sneakers with an initial retail price of a thousand yuan are often resold for tens of thousands. Some people might say, that's right, rare things are precious. But it's precisely because the scarcity principle has a strong influence on our determination of the value of things that the little trick of artificially creating scarcity naturally emerges. And in life, 
we are often manipulated by these tricks. The most common one is, our store is clearing out inventory, only three days left. But a month later, it's still only three days left. All kinds of limited edition and limited sale promotions played by businesses are creating scarcity to stimulate buying frenzies. These activities and products invisibly increase our sense of urgency and shorten our thinking time for purchasing. If you're not careful, your hand will make the payment. Moreover, the power of the scarcity principle has another unique source, reactants. Simply put, when you want to do something and others don't let you, you'll be even more determined to do it. Here, we have to mention the tragic story of Romeo and Juliet, the two lovers whose families were mortal enemies, committed double suicide in order to rebel against their parents' attempts to separate them, using this most extreme tragic method to express their free will. Why did Romeo and Juliet develop such extraordinarily intense feelings in such a short time? This may be due to parental interference and the resulting reactance. Of course, in this process, parents also need to provide appropriate guidance. There are many more examples of reactance in our lives. For instance, the more a movie is banned, the more people want to watch it. Not because the movie is so great, but simply because it's a banned film. For example, if I changed the title of this psychology series to Decoding the Six Banned Books in the Global Psychology Field, it would give a different feeling. It's difficult to remain rational in the face of scarcity pressure, because as soon as we see that something we want to obtain is no longer available, we tend to act impulsively and irrationally. Faced with this dilemma, Cialdini recommends a two-step coping method. First, as soon as we feel that we're experiencing a high degree of emotional fluctuation under the influence of scarcity, we should take that fluctuation as a signal to pause and tell ourselves to calm down. You can set a signal for yourself. As soon as this urge arises, give yourself a hey first. Then ask yourself why we want that thing. If at this point our inner answer is that we want it for its function, such as wanting to wear these shoes to play basketball or wanting to taste that cookie, then we should remind ourselves that the shoes won't make our basketball skills better because they're scarce, and scarce cookies won't taste better either. Remember, what's scarce isn't the best. What's suitable for you is the best. With that, the breakdown of influence is coming to an end. Traditional economics believes that everyone participating in market economic activities is a rational person. Rational people can always make optimal choices. But with the development of psychology and behavioral economics, people have discovered that rational people can't always maintain rationality. Because our abilities and energy are limited, let alone in today's information explosion, in order to pursue efficiency while reducing our own burden, sometimes we have no choice but to abandon the time-consuming, complex, holistic decision-making process. Instead, we use a simpler, more primitive, mechanical response method – similar to the turkey mother who triggers nurturing behavior through the cheap, cheap sound of baby turkeys. This is why we so frequently use factors like reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority and scarcity to automatically make compliant decisions. But the difference between humans and turkeys is that human automatic responses are not innate but learned in the postnatal environment. Therefore, as the environment changes, human automatic responses also change. For example, people today may be indifferent to a big clearance sale downstairs, able to accept clothing store fitting services with a clear conscience, and have become numb to supermarket free samples. This is also a limitation of the book Influence. 
Some of the cases in the book are commonplace to us now, unable to stir up a ripple in our hearts. The development of the times and the diversification of marketing methods have allowed businesses and consumers to grow together. What we want to emphasize here is that actually most automatic responses are harmless. The value of automatic responses lies in helping us effectively reduce decision-making costs so that we don't have to put more energy into outsmarting businesses. Of course, we don't deny that there will be some who exploit people's psychological weaknesses for their own gain. But who can assert that their own heart is impenetrable and flawless? The purpose of this book is not to let businesses trick consumers or to let consumers counter-trick them, even if we understand these tricks, principles, effects, etc. If we can't face our own hearts and establish a correct view of consumption, we will still have a hard time escaping unscathed. Therefore, at any time, improving our own knowledge and independent thinking ability is of the utmost importance. This is the purpose of our analysis of this book. Only in this way can we perhaps become truly rational people.